And there are some ideas that someone could say, uh, you go to a brewery, you know, some breweries have restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, and you can imagine that with meat production in the future, you could be in a brewery that has on one side, the tanks that are, that have yeast and everything that are, that are brewing the beer. And then on the other side, you've got the cells that are being cultured and, uh, and, and, and cultured into meat. Mm -hmm. And those things are being produced and sort of given to you on the table. Um, and that's, that's not that strange. It's DeAndre here, and this is The Pioneer Show, the show where we talk with innovators, makers, entrepreneurs, basically people who are trailing their own trails and creating their own lives, so that we all can learn how to work on our own lives. If this is your first time here, thank you for downloading and listening, and I appreciate you taking the time to hear this episode. Subscribe and enjoy listening to The Pioneers of today. If you're a repeat listener, welcome back. This is episode 29, and I'm your host, Andre Diabker. You can find me at It's the Andre on Twitter, as well as the show at Pioneers Show on Instagram. This podcast was never meant to be focused on any specific topic before besides technology. The truth is, somehow I've been getting more and more interested in topics such as health or the future of work. Not by design, but mostly because these are the matters that are affecting me personally right now. In this episode, I interview someone that it's in the intersection of worlds that I am deeply passionate about. Entrepreneurship, career shifting, health, and accelerators. Munia Chivasa is a scientist turned patent lawyer, turned consultant, turned accelerator head for the Merck Group, one of the longest standing health and pharma groups in the world. Interested already? I'm sure you are. And we go over topics such as organ printing, livestock free meat production, and the future of healthcare worldwide. Not only the biggest prizes, but biggest hubs of innovation. I was really impressed by Munia, and I want to share this conversation with you. Welcome to the show, Munia. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Andre. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure. And first of all, I would like to thank Piabo PR with Nora Welbeck for arranging this conversation. Probably, we already figured this out, there would be a chance that we probably could have met eventually because of so many people that we've had on the podcast and apparently that we know. But we'd like to, first of all, thank Piabo PR for arranging this conversation. So, Munia, for people who have no idea who you are, care to give us a presentation? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, my name is Munya. I'm heading the Merck Accelerator. Uh, I'm Zimbabwean uh, and I've been living in Germany for the last nine years or so. Uh, I've uh, in, in a past life, I was a biochemist and a pharmacologist, uh, sort of um, tried to transition out of that, going through intellectual property, mm -hmm. uh, trying to become a patent attorney. Um, that didn't work out well for me. Um, so I ended up in tech transfer, uh, so working Uh, where academia uh, meets uh, meets enterprise essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, did that for a number of years in the UK uh, before coming into to Germany, where I worked in, um, in 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 consultancy, basic innovation management. Uh, that led me uh, to Merck, um, mm -hmm. who was setting up a group innovation unit uh, called the Innovation Center, mm -hmm. uh, where I've been since 2015. Uh, and uh, during my stay here, uh, I've been responsible for setting up. Uh, our accelerator program, as well as the Innovation Center itself, uh, together with a very, very good team. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've grown quite a bit uh, since uh, 2015. Um, now, mostly trying to figure out how we can uh, build collaborations between the startups uh, that have a very good link with Merck uh, and some of the business units, as well as the innovation projects that we work on in the Innovation Center. So we're building a platform for collaboration, essentially. It's very interesting. And I have to ask this. So you went from neuropharmacology eventually to patent lawyer. So how did that, how did that came to be? Oh yeah. Okay. As a, as a, um, <laughs> uh, that's a, that's, that's a slightly long story. So uh, my, my dad, my dad back in the day used to work for the, for the African intellectual property organization, um, mm -hmm. a body called Aripo. Uh, and, um, As a, as a as a kid, I was always interested in, in sort of the papers that I knew that's back, right? So uh, trying to, to understand what's going on there. Uh, he was in finance um, and administration, uh, but it, it opened up a door to me to, to realize that there are a lot of scientists who are not working as scientists. Uh, and there were a group of people who specialized in science and in law um, and found a home in between. And that fascinated me for a while. Uh, and so when I, when I pursued my science degree um, and when I started working in a lab, uh, I slowly realized that the, um, the life in the lab is, is great, um, but I'm not one built for it. Okay. Uh, but I still wanted to be close to the science. Uh, and patent law was the, one of the first things that sort of, uh, that sort of came to me. 
uh, at the time. So I, I pursued that um, that direction. So not not straying too far away from the science, uh, but not necessarily living it on a day to day. So not being necessarily the scientist with the lab coat, but also being part of the conversation, but being far the, far away as possible, being far away enough that you don't have to live it every day and have to deal with the stresses and the burnout that it might came with it, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. Because the idea is, right, so you're in the lab, um, uh, most scientists are looking for that, for that one discovery, right? So that, and, and sort of to, to, to really sort of using experimentation uh, to test out theories and come up with that, uh, that spark. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of felt like patent attorneys are the ideal place, right? Because once the inventor or the scientist comes up with a spark, one of the first things they're going to go to is a patent attorney mm -hmm. to make sure that their invention is protected. So I felt like every day in a patent attorney's life could be that someone comes with a spark, someone comes with a great idea, and you're constantly sort of in that wave of high of discovery, right? So it felt like the ideal career for me. <laughs> well, uh, that's apparently that, that's it think. was not. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so in good reason. So I, I love patent attorneys, um, but I think uh, you, you end up writing a lot more letters between you and the examiner than than uh, than than hearing new discoveries mm, okay okay and how did you go from that part to so remind me again you went from neuropharmacology so it was uh, it was pharmacology actually so uh, biochemistry pharmacology. and pharmacology biochemistry and pharmacology to patent lawyer and then to consultant uh in the in the, the step in the middle was the critical one um i joined uh, a tech transfer office uh, in the uk so uh imperial innovations is the name uh, close to uh, it's basically associated with imperial college um mm -hmm. and there was a really interesting approach so most of the people that i the, uh, the most of the people know what a tech transfer office is i, I assume but the idea is uh in academia uh, a lot of people coming up with research results that they feel Uh, could be very good to commercialize. Mm -hmm. And there's a team um, that understand the technology, that understand the business landscape, that then go and talk to some of the inventors and like, yeah, so some of the professors, uh, people in academia who are doing research to really um, sort of identify what kind of um, commercialization strategies. How can you get the discoveries in the lab into, um, into market? So how can you get it to the people, basically? Uh, okay. What kind of partnerships do you need to set up Um, and in many cases, it might be new ventures that have to be built. And those people in the tech transfer offices are in the front line uh, of trying to build that first business, uh, the business and intellectual property strategy that could actually drive uh, basic research results into applied commercial products. Interesting. So, and this, actually, this conversation actually comes at the right place because recently, and I think it was this week that was published an interview that I did in partnership with Samsung Next uh, that I did at uh, Tech Open Air Berlin. And I actually interviewed cool. a, a, CEO and a, a CEO of a company that's emerged between a business that was created from a university, from the academia. They're called Oxford mm -hmm. VR. And it's funny because I have actually introduced Barbara to them because they have, oh, they cool. do VR. VR and healthcare yeah. to the to the therapy. So I thought, okay, this they, these two have to meet, and it's interesting that yeah. you are working on that. So, but you went from Zimbabwe. Were you in Zimbabwe doing the patent office, or were you already in Europe? Uh, I was already in Europe. So uh, that was after um, that was after my uh, my master's program in in London, basically. So I I, I did my master's program at uh, Queen Mary's College in University of London. Uh, okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So, and from that point, that's, I assume when you went from the patent officer to the, talent, the tech talent transfer in this part that you just mentioned that you got, I assume, the interest to more in this technology innovation side, that's probably where the, the spark might have come. That's the spark from the scientist that's, that came to you through the tech that, talent. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, one, one thing that, uh, that I have to appreciate about my, my, my former employer is um, Uh, they had they had a very very interesting setup, right? So they had the tech transfer company uh, with a business builder and a venture capital arm uh, all in one. So okay. you could see the whole trajectory of uh, results from a from basic research lab getting into this business building effort mm -hmm. and then actually scaling with VC funding. You could see that in one organization, um, and sort of that really sort of pushed me in this direction. Um, it, it sort of sparked, it sort of opened up channels that I never knew existed, right? So if I was, uh, if, if I had just stayed in, in the little bubble of science and law, uh, sort of opening up the, uh, the concept of, 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 of what actually, what actually 
uh, really moves the needle when it comes to, um, to, to pushing scientific, science-driven innovations. You need a lot of funding and you need a lot of research. And sort of that, um, and that, and that bridging capital is usually extremely, extremely difficult to get. Mm-hmm. And these guys had it in one go. Uh, so it was actually, yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's a very formative. It's a very interesting thing, and it's actually something that I also asked Valentino. Um, but the, the the question that I have for you is coming from a very academic background or in the science background. How did you find the transition going from technology or from the hard sciences, from like pharmacology? It, actually, is it a hard science or is it applied science? Um, I would say <laughs> so. It's it's a natural science, uh, okay. and it is uh, yeah. I think it's 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 application driven because you can okay. you can actually you can actually yeah. I mean, okay, you can so apply it in the pharma, pharma space. So how how was the transition going from a natural science to a very unscientific world of business and technology and innovation? Uh, so I, I had, I, I feel like I had, uh, I had very good guide, uh, guardrail. So, so I, uh, having, having gone from, uh, from, uh, science to, uh, to, to the business side mm-hmm. via IP law, um, makes for, makes for a really good transition because you still are looking at, um, uh, how can you put, how can you protect uh, scientific results or technological innovations. So mm-hmm. there's still that very good link. And then the natural step is why am I protecting this? Because I need to commercialize it in the future. And then you're already starting to think of the commercial strategies, uh, the business implications. Uh, so it was a stepwise approach. I think if I had been like, so if I had taken the step that Valentino did, so that's really impressive, right? So going from, uh, I, I'm, I have a, I'm a biomedical engineer. I'm a biomedical scientist. And then I'm going to set up a business that's yeah. going to have commercial value. That's being thrown into the deep end. And I feel like my path was sort of slowly going, um, uh, going from the shallow end uh, with steps in between. Um, uh, there, there, there were clear immersion points, but they mm-hmm. weren't as deep as now run your company, figure out where you get your finance. But it was, it was, a, it was a good transition for me. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. So you you weren't necessarily thrown into the wolves. You just had a an easier approach to it, and yeah. you were thrown into the wolves when you went to the consultancy business, I assume. Yes. <laughs> so that was yeah. So so the 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 the, cli- the sort of going going to serve clients, uh, standing in front of clients was was a uh, yeah. That was an eye opener, right? So because initially initially you you in my in, in the previous part of my career it was. Uh, talking to scientists or talking to lawyers, so people you have a very good, uh, good understanding of 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 of, um, of, of their concepts, uh, and then being thrown into the into the in the consultancy world, um, you're meeting more commercially driven people mm-hmm. um, who might have a science background, but who are really looking at um, who are very uh, revenue driven, revenue orientated, and are really tight on the schedules in which they need to. They, they need to deliver certain projects. Um, uh, I have to say life sciences, entrepreneurship is a bit more of a patient game. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know that there are quite a number of hurdles. You know that the, the, the regulatory and approval processes are, 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 are marked in a certain way. So you kind of understand where value inflection points are, are reached. But consultancy is uh, a bit more hard paced, mm-hmm. fast paced rather. So <laughs> that's, where, that's where things are there, interesting. <laughs> are there any resources that you recommend for people who are going through this part of life? So they're going from a var, very natural or hard science word, world rather, and going more into mm-hmm. a business perspective. I've already talked with Valentino about this, but I, I guess your input will, will also be very valuable as somebody who's not only lived through it, but I assume when we'll talk about this with the Mark Accelerator, you also help people go through this as well. So any resources that you usually recommend? Um, so in terms of resources, I think so one, one, one very, very good resource is, um, is listening to people, people like, like you. So having people okay. listen to your shows, they're people who've lived through this as right? so, uh, just understanding, uh, some of the journeys that people have taken and, and podcasts are great, uh, for that. Um, there are also quite a number of blogs, um, 
uh, out there that uh, that sort of talk about the, the business side of science uh, mm-hmm. that can slowly get you immersed into uh, into the commercial aspects of the work that you maybe work on in the lab. Um, and uh, one of my favorites is hackathons and startup days, startup weekends. Um, so if you, especially in the south of Germany here, there are quite a few of these hackathons and startup weekends that are pretty much uh, science and life science driven. Um, oh, really? You get, yeah. Uh, Heidelberg has a very good uh, life science hackathon, life science meets IT hackathon. Um, here in Dar- here in Germany, in Darmstadt, uh, we also run a, run a couple of hackathons that are very much um, uh, driven by challenges that are being faced by companies like Merck. Um, Evonik, uh, a chemicals company, also run hackathons in this part of the, the region as well. Um, so you, you start getting the, the challenges that are typical, but uh, you also get the, uh, the business side of things. Why are these commercially interesting problems, even if there are technical uh, solutions to them? So you get to interact with uh, the mentors who provide the challenges. They give you insights into the market as they see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they give you insights into they get they get you to to bridge your technical solution to a commercial uh, business case. Um, so as a and and you interact with uh, with a mix of people. Mm-hmm. So for for typical hackathons that we run, we encourage um, people who are more economics and business driven uh, in terms of their major in university uh, to interact with people who are more creative or who are from more from more of a scientific discipline. So you get this early exchange. How can you work in teams um, that can that are diverse in nature mm-hmm. uh, uh, to deliver the same goal, um, a technological solution in prototype with a business case that comes with it, and that's already that already gets you thinking differently. Yeah, because you I, like you said, in the science is a very sp- slow slower pace because of the, the, the you have to have a lot of patience i assume a lot of data points be able to announce something on a science level but on the startups you have to produce fast do stuff test it out and do a lot of things so i actually i, I agree that going through an hackathon or some kind of startup weekend or a startup event can also open a lot of eyes for people in the science community that otherwise would be pre-programmed and pre defined to have a very slow approach but at the same time i wonder and you have more experience on this if it might not be too much of a shock like shocks shocking the system if it's too fast what the hell's going on yeah <laughs> uh, that's a that's a that's a fair point actually so i um i i have to say i've um the the most uh, the most um science scientist heavy hackathon that we've had uh, at merck was in israel Okay. Um, uh, we've run two hackathons there, uh, and, uh, people who've been running PhDs as so who've been doing PhDs have uh, took time out to, to spend a weekend to think about these problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be honest, I didn't sense like they were being, they, I didn't sense like they, they were sort of entering a culture shock, but it was actually a very pleasant surprise for them. Right. So having worked over 24 hours and then actually coming up with something they could, they could propose. Um, mm-hmm. was actually, it seemed as if, in, in my opinion, um, uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a good opportunity uh, for them. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, once again, eye-opening, I assume, would be the, the biggest, because it's such yeah, a, this, yeah. and the funny thing is that from talking to some people in science is that we might be in the same culture, but we're such in so different universes in terms of application and speed of work that sometimes it can be, what the hell is just too much noise? Can everybody just please yeah. shut up and let me think? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so continuing your, your life story still. So you went from consultant and then you got to Merck. Yeah. Yeah. Let's assume uh, that somebody doesn't know what Merck is. Sure. What is Merck? Uh, I'll be, okay. So, so Merck, Merck is a, is a, is a vibrant science and technology company um, with, uh, with a rich history. So uh, this year is our 351st year of existence. Oh, wow. Uh, Merck started off, yeah, um, pretty, pretty deep history there. Uh, Merck started off as a, as a, as a pharmacy uh, here in Darmstadt um, uh, and uh, in 1668. 
uh, and expanded over the years to uh, a chemicals company, um, a sort of chemicals driven pharmaceutical company. Uh, and I think we still be, we are the oldest pharmaceutical and chemicals company in the world um, to what we are now, which is a, a science and technology company that is uh, that has leading positions in biopharma, in um, in life sciences, uh, uh, in and in performance materials. Uh, just to maybe add a bit more on the other two businesses, mm-hmm. performance materials is. Um, is our advanced chemicals business uh, where we provide uh, solutions in the semiconductor industry space. Uh, we provide display solutions as well. So materials that are, that are, that are, uh, that are used in, in, in displays. Uh, so like liquid crystals, uh, OLEDs, um, uh, OLEDs and lighting. So that connection mm-hmm. to marching. Um, uh, and uh, the life science business uh, is, is really sort of focused on uh, is is actually the leading provider of uh, of uh, life science reagents, tools, and equipment uh, in most uh, biotech labs, uh, whether uh, industrial, clinical, um, and in some quality control labs as well. So in food uh, and environment uh, monitoring, uh, and in in healthcare, in the biopharma, our main therapeutic areas are uh, oncology, oncology and immune oncology. Uh, we have a general medicine franchise uh, that has cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular therapies, um, uh, as well as um, uh, some hormone therapies as well for thyroid dysfunction. Uh, and we have um, a strong portfolio on on fertility uh, solutions, uh, so supporting um, uh, uh, couples who, who are trying to 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 go through in, in vitro fertilization. Interesting. So you you in 2015 you got to be an innovation facilitator at Merck. That's right. Once again, not a lot of people will understand <laughs> the job role or even the name. Innovation, I get it. Yeah. Facilitator, what the hell? What? Innovation well, facilitator, what's going on? People are going crazy this today. They're, they're coming up with new job roles. What the hell's going on? So, Monia, could you just enlighten or the, the audience? Sure, sure, sure. So this is this is uh, a lot of this is in hindsight, right? So um, I'm defining this in hindsight. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> uh, so like it, when we when I joined Merck in 2015, um, it was to to join the the innovation center team, um, and uh, the head of the innovation center, Michael Gamber, uh, was was right in the middle of really founding this team. So uh, I was the first of two hires at the time, mm-hmm. uh, joining a team of um, uh, three people at the time. Uh, so innovation facilitator was really a catch-all name for we're going to build this innovation center. We're going to figure out what processes we're going to work on. Um, we're going to make sure that uh, we identify interesting uh, topics uh, within the company where we can call for ideas, support the ideators into building these projects as entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. and also find a way to 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 um, to improve to to enhance the uh, the entrepreneurial mindset within the company as well. So having a cultural, uh, not, a, not necessarily a cultural change focus, but uh, sort of improving the culture around innovation and the way entrepreneurship was seen. Um, so one of the first things that we, uh, we did was try to set up the structures of the innovation center. Uh, first in line was um, an ideation funnel. How do we approach employees within the company, and what kind of ideas should we be following up on? Uh, and the ideas we we ended up uh, looking into were, I mean, this is why the innovation center was set up in the end, uh, building businesses uh, between and beyond the three sectors. So between performance materials, uh, life science, and healthcare, uh, leveraging the expertise and the technologies and the know-how of the market that we have in those three sectors. Mm-hmm. So as an innovation facilitator, it was essentially do what needs to be done for us to build the next generation businesses. And Merck here would work as, let's call let's use the word facilitator once again, would, would work as a facilitator, not only and an investor for these businesses to flourish, but under the guard and under the, the experience and name of the Merck so that they could be able to venture off, but still be protected because they had somebody to fall back on if they had any trouble. Is that it? Pretty much, yeah. So, so it's um, it's it's a group of Merck employees who make up these entrepreneurial opportunities, um, and it was it was during those early stages that we started uh, trying to figure out how can we include external impulses uh, um, uh, through uh, to the innovation center, uh, and that's where we set up the the accelerator program. 
uh, to mm-hmm. start off with. So back back then, um, uh, the accelerator program was focused on on looking into the digital uh, solutions. Uh, so these companies that were in in um, sort of looking at digital solutions in our business sectors, mm-hmm. um, trying to inspire. Uh, and sort of provide a bit more insights uh, to the general company as to what is possible uh, mm-hmm. and also support the entrepreneurs who are working in this space because we saw the opportunity of partnering with them at some point. Interesting. That's very, that's, that's very interesting. And one, one thing that I, I want to understand because I kind of drifted mm-hmm. off of, of a second ago because of this, you said that you had an, an hackathon in Israel. Yeah. So uh, is, two, action. Two, exactly. So, and they're the most hard science ones, right? You mentioned uh, that that was the um, that was the one with the highest quota of of scientists in so, it. So uh, the for, question for that, that I have for you is: How many innovation centers? How many innovation centers does Merck have? Uh, there is one innovation center. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's the one we have here in Darmstadt, but we have uh, we have an, uh, uh, two innovation hubs. Hubs, okay. Uh, hubs, yeah. So we have two innovation hubs, one in China and one in in uh, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in Silicon Makes Valley. sense. And then, yeah, and then we have uh, incubators in um, in 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 Israel. So, so we have two incubators in Israel. So you being in the, the the center, let's say the central hub or the center innovation center for Merck, you also have connections with all these hubs that are spread out throughout the world, from Middle East, China. San Francisco, you have connections so that you can also have, gather the information and knowledge that these hubs share between them. That's very interesting. So from your experience, is there any country or are there any couple of countries or a number of countries that are right now in the forefront of health or let's say the other two businesses, biopharma and, and chemical products and everything that are in the forefront that you're seeing and that you have the ability to say now that probably five years ago you wouldn't be able to say because they're surprising? Um, uh, so I'll, yeah, actually, so I'll throw in, I'll throw in Taiwan because we recently launched an innovation lab there as well. Uh, I forgot to mention it. No problem. Um, that's, that's been a, that's been a really good, that's been a really interesting surprise for me over the last two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, Taiwan, uh, being a small, small country that it is, has, has very, very interesting, um, uh, co- convergence of, um, the semiconductor industry. Mm-hmm. And really high quality uh, healthcare provision um, and education as well. Uh, and what we've started seeing is that uh, this convergence of where this convergence of semiconductor industry and healthcare are leading to very very interesting solutions for uh, sort of for more downstream, so for discover on the discovery side uh, mm-hmm. of healthcare. Uh, we're currently working with four teams that are looking at uh, quite interesting solutions that could lead into. Uh, novel companion diagnostic platforms, um, uh, very, uh, uh, very, uh, very low cost um, uh, point of care uh, diagnostic systems as well. Uh, just because of this, this leading um, uh, leading component of theirs in, in semiconductor space and the interaction of the semiconductor experts with healthcare experts as well. So that's that's something that's surprising for me. Uh, but um, I'd say I would say. Uh, Israel is still a very, uh, very, very advanced um, uh, space uh, when it comes to technological technological solutions in in, in healthcare. Mm-hmm. Uh, our venture our venture arm um, does a lot of deal sourcing in, in Israel uh, as well. Uh, but Germany is also uh, sort of doing quite well when it comes to digital health. Uh, it's been a slow growth, but it's almost there. Um, and I'm very, very optimistic about the UK. Really? Yeah. Actually, that it doesn't surprise that China and you have offices in China and, and San Francisco, but it's interesting that you mentioned that Israel is in the front front or has been a driving force in this area because have you ever heard of the book Startup Nation? Yes. Yeah. yeah so yes. Israel is a startup nation, is the, is the, is the forefront not only <laughs> in health, but it's in cybersecurity, <laughs> it's in military tech for other reasons, but it's, it's one of the biggest technology hubs in Tel Aviv. It must be unbelievable. It must be like a driving, frenetic startup world there. I, 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 I always wonder how it can be there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely worth a visit. And, I'm, and we're hoping to, to have, um, to have uh, at least one more session this, week, this year uh, with, our, with our colleagues in, uh, at the incubators in Israel, um, just to connect a bit more with the, with the ecosystem there. 
Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, we're in, we're in these locations because they're the hotspots, uh, Shanghai and Beijing and Guangzhou, also very interesting, interesting solutions coming out there. Uh, in fact, uh, in China, we're, we're, we're looking a lot in AI enabled healthcare mm -hmm. and there are quite a lot of solutions that are, um, applications there as well, um, that are coming from that side. Um, uh, San Francisco has always been interesting for, for, for tech. Yeah. Um, uh, including health tech, uh, although I recently learned uh, that um, the places like Austin uh, are are sort of really? coming up with with very very interesting solutions in healthcare as well. Yeah, I, th um, I think they, Valentino they also good. went through an accelerator in Austin, so he might give you some Absolutely, feedback there. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, sh I should probably reach out to him for that. <laughs> in particular, <laughs> making connections, making connections right here. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah actually, and you were mentioning so, and and I wonder in China, a, a place like Shenzhen, which is such a hardware place and such mm -hmm. a, a technology and innovation hub, wouldn't it? Yeah. This is me spitting out the, an idea, but wouldn't it be interesting at least for the chemical side of, of things and the semiconductors and everything? Because it can be at a place where America can also have a stamp of power there. I assume. Yes, yeah, so we're opening our hub in Shenzhen in October. Ah. Uh, October. So yeah, you're, you're, you're right there. You're, you're following <laughs> our, our process. <laughs> uh, going back to the accelerator program. So can you explain how your accelerator program works? We already had a couple of people from Techstars, for example, but I would just like to have an idea of what's the main differences. Of course, you have different focuses, at, at least in terms of research. Sure. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe I start off with the, the idea that our accelerator program is, uh, is, is essentially a, a collaboration platform. Um, uh, for, 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 for startups that are, that are, that are eager to work with a corporate, mm -hmm. uh, working in our space. So the, the three, the three business sectors, and then we have, uh, three so-called innovation fields where we're looking to, to build up, um, uh, common, uh, platforms together with startups, uh, um, so actually innovative, um, uh, innovative solutions that could lead to, uh, joint ventures or joint developments. Uh, and these three are clean meat. So looking at um, uh, lab-grown meat, uh, sort of uh, livestock-free production mm -hmm. uh, of meat. Uh, we are looking at biosensing and interfaces, which really fits into our our healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, life science and performance materials to a certain extent. Uh, how can you get novel sensors um, uh, uh, and the, the, the data from the sensors and actually provide insights that are either prognostic or diagnostic um, uh, that actually give you a therapeutic, uh, they give you uh, uh, something to act on, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the last one being liquid biopsy. We're trying mm -hmm. to, to, to encourage a minimal, uh, sort of, to encourage uh, reducing uh, the invasiveness of certain diagnostic procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're working on looking for startups working on these, on these new technologies that would reduce the invasiveness uh, of certain procedures, whether it's uh, in sample preparation, uh, new types of biomarkers that you can track, uh, or new bodily fluids uh, where you can track different types of biomarkers as well. So, depending on the pathology yeah. that you're that you're testing for, you can be able, you can, in theory, I assume in practice as well, but you can do some liquid biopsies using bodily fluids that otherwise would you wouldn't know that they were there. But it's interesting when you mentioned non-invasive. Procedures and then mention biopsy. I think biopsy by its very design, it's it's intrusive. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> by, by, by its very nature. So we understand that there's some uh, there's some uh, there's some biopsies that, that I mean you can't avoid biopsies, right? So it's essentially taking um, uh, taking samples, but you can reduce the invasiveness of some of them. It's right? so, uh, and that's what that's what we're trying to find uh, those kind of solutions that that reduce the invasiveness uh, and speed up maybe um, time to diagnosis as well. It's very interesting. This, but going back to the question, so how does the program, is it like a three-month program uh, or a six-month program? So, right. So, it is a three to six-month. Uh, so, we try, to, we try to make it a bit flexible. Um, uh, the, the general idea, since the general idea is that uh, you are, we're providing a platform where you can, you can run a, P, a proof of concept and pilot mm -hmm. uh, together with Merck um, to, to essentially de-risk, uh, the opportunity, uh, the opportunity for our internal businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, so usually the startup that the startups that we, that, that we accept in the program have had a bit of traction within the organization. Someone wants to work with them, uh, but is not quite sure. 
so what we like to run with the, with the startup is a proof of concept of the potential relationship. So it's not building a new product together. It might be, it, mm-hmm. it actually might be, but it's not about us uh, building a proof of concept for the startup or together with the startup, but it's building a proof of concept of the relationship. So if that means, if, if, if that means, um, if that means there's a, there's a modification to, to the startup technology, then yes, of course, uh, that will mean uh, prototyping in a new way. But the idea is that you, uh, at the end of the three months, uh, there should be um, a clear decision uh, from the merchant terminal party as to how we, uh, and, the, and the startup, as to where the shared value is, uh, where the win-win is, mm-hmm. and uh, what kind of approach goes, comes next. Interesting. Uh, so I think that's 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 a slight difference to uh, to traditional accelerators like like Tech, for instance. I think uh, this is this is really about getting getting to to a certain investor readiness. I think there there, there are a lot of things that you have to to, to think of um, uh, for the uh, to, to to actually gain traction with with future investors. Uh, for us, we're hoping that uh, you securing a relationship with Merck would mean that there's additional validation that you can go to your investors and talk about. Um, and, mm-hmm. and help you uh, help you help you get that 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 ex, that external boost uh, in terms of uh, capital. It's a step um, of approval, basically. Could, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the hope. What we're hoping that many of the startups do is either gain Merck as a client, mm-hmm. uh, get get Merck as a as a preferred supplier, uh, in case of some of the materials and data that we that we have, um, or actually go into joint development uh, with with Merck. Uh, for mm. for certain pro- products or services, so can a startup working with the Merck accelerator? What kind of resources can a startup ask or expect? I don't I don't want to say ask for because then you can ask for anything. But what can yeah. a startup specifically? Yes. What can you expect? get? Sure. So uh, we offer we offer a bit of fi- uh, a bit of funding, so up to fifty thousand euros. Uh, that you can leverage during the course of um, of of, uh, of the of the program. Um, we also offer uh, sort of maker space uh, facilities. Uh, so we have three um, uh, D printers, we have laser cutters, we have things you would expect in in, in most most modern day um, maker spaces. We also have an AR VR studio. Uh, yes. You can imagine why we have that now, <laughs> um, where startups can actually prototype an environment. So that that's actually accessible as well. Uh, we are uh, we also have limited um, lab space. Um, uh, we're still working on sort of very sort of on bio level uh, lab spaces, but for simple analytics um, and some simple experiments, we can uh, we can cater for some of the startups that that that, that would like to try out some things in in, in the lab. Uh, here, uh, they have access to uh, Merck expertise as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they have. Um, so we have within the accelerator, we have a, a, a team of facilitators who are, who are also engaging with the organization, sort of trying to figure out who you need to get in touch with, mm-hmm. um, how you could how you could propose certain things to them, uh, sort of helping you shape your pitch to them, essentially, um, and supporting you along the way. Uh, as you try to expand your your customer base at Merck uh, or your sponsor base at Merck, basically, uh, so you have access to at least a Merck internal person who was guiding you through the organization and helping you open doors. So simple things like uh, uh, if a startup like um, if, if Valentino, for instance, wants to talk to the head of oncology, uh, uh, head of oncology, and um, uh, he asks one of us, we could try to see. When is this guy in Darmstadt or wherever we are? When is he available in the calendar? And just make a simple calendar invite, right? Yeah. So, so simple, simple things like that um, uh, would would actually would be actually be something that the startups can benefit from. Um, and of course, we we have um, uh, sessions where you can interact with our ventures team. So for those that are already looking at um, uh, external financing and, uh, and a sort of uh, future rounds. Uh, uh, they get to interact with the venture team, sort of understand uh, how they work, uh, what kind of things they look for, um, and sort of get really frank feedback um, uh, from an external, from an investor. I think. And one thing yeah. to ask is, so basically, Mark also can invest from a venture part can also invest. Absolutely. So Absolutely. let's assume that I have a startup and it's a hundred percent the future of pharmacy and the future yeah. of Merck. 
can I expect not only an investment, but can I expect uh, a, an acquisition eventually or a hire, let's call it? Has that happened before? So that hasn't happened through the pipeline of, um, of okay. the accelerator uh, since 2015. Uh, but that has happened on... That has happened on several occasions, but not necessarily through the, yeah, uh, the pipeline. Not necessarily through that. Yeah. So uh, Merck is, uh, is, is... So we have, we have a number of ways in which we partner with, with startups. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and of course, m a so acquisitions are, are, are one. Uh, our biopharma pipeline has, to a certain extent, uh, partially been built through some of these acquisitions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the venture arm uh, that do strategic invest, investments as well. And then we have things like the accelerator, where it's, where it's, where it's, um, where it's more about these strategic collaborations as well. Uh, mm-hmm. But the output from the accelerator goes out to everyone in the organization as well. So the community of people who would interact with the startup from, uh, from the accelerator include people who would make uh, M&A decisions and the people who would make um, uh, venture decisions as well. It hasn't happened doesn't mean that it won't happen, but it won't happen at least through this process. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, I have to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, and I have this is a personal interest. I don't know if yeah. anyone from the guest from from the audience will listen, but I have a very specific diet that's very meat focused. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I basically eat meat every day, for example. Okay, yeah. Uh, I know that it's not good for the environment. Blah 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 blah. I don't. I, honestly, I don't pay attention to to that argument specifically. But the question is. Is clean meat, because you mentioned the clean meat, so um, you, you said a, an expression about clean meat as a non, non-animal non farming, was something like this, right? Yeah, and so without livestock. You know. livestock non-livestock meat creation. How yeah. does that work? Uh, so uh, there are quite a lot of uh, companies at the moment that, um, uh, that are working on different solutions. So maybe I'll give an example of uh, a company that, uh, that Merck actually invested in recently. Uh, a company is called Mosa Meats. Uh, they actually are making a, a a beef burger without having to to kill um, to 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 raise and kill a cow. Okay. Uh, so what they're doing, what they've done is they've uh, they've taken a biopsy earlier on in life of a, <laughs> of a certain beef, of a certain cow, uh, so a, sa- a sample of cells, um, and they've been culturing these cells, um, sort of and 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 growing them uh, and such, uh, growing them and then collecting them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and then uh, packaging them basically like the, the beef patties, mm-hmm. uh, because because they because I mean it's it's essentially means to beef like so a mass of cells. Um, it's 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 much easier at the moment. Uh, when they started it off, I think uh, as a research uh, as a research project, I think part partially funded by one of the Google founders, uh, they they uh, they did the first uh, lab grown burgers. I think it was 2012 or so, uh, and those 250,000 each US dollars. Um, so it's still quite it's still quite a way away. Um, and uh, now um, I think those costs are are, are down to below 10,000 euros, right? So per mm-hmm. So slowly and slowly, it's getting there. That's the but market's the working basically. That, yeah, but but the gen the, the general concept is uh, you find a way to grow uh, these cells. Um, whether it's in bioreactors, um, whether you're doing it on certain scaffolds, uh, whether you're doing sort of a, a, um, a, 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 a whole line of cell cultures, um, but the idea is that you you can grow these um, you you can you can grow these uh, 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 these these tissues mm-hmm. using tissue engineering. Uh, so this is always this is something that's been researched quite a bit in the healthcare side, in the healthcare space. People have been trying to grow organs. Uh, oh, people wow. have already been doing skin, right? So from back in the day, for for medical purposes, and mm-hmm. now the idea is: can you can you actually build the same kind of uh, can you actually build the same kind of scale to feed people? That you know, on a nutritional level, is it anywhere close to re- to let's call it in quotes real meat? Uh, yeah, um, so even better. Right? So one of the reasons why uh, the first term that we we picked is clean meat. Um, is is not only from the environmental perspective, right? So yes, uh, the the water footprint we know, the carbon, the the uh, the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions are in 
are really ridiculous for, for our food production right now. But at the same time, um, things like pork, things like, um, uh, like chicken um, and, and beef, uh, most livestock production, so mass production, really includes um, uh, a lot of antibiotics going mm-hmm. into, the, in, in, into, into the, the feed cycle. Uh, there are a lot of, sorry to say this, there, there's, there are a lot of feces Oh, no problem. No problem. <laughs> that, interact with, that, that interact with the meat that we eat <laughs> during the, the slaughtering process. Tasty. Right? Tasty. So, uh, <laughs> right? That's that extra flavor. Um, uh, and you can imagine doing this in uh, doing this in a in a factory setting, in a in a in a lab or factory setting uh, where you don't actually have actual animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, it becomes much cleaner, like most of the food production spaces that we have. Um, uh, uh, right now, where it's really a clean production line, really clean packaging, that's exactly what you would expect. Um, I was reading a book about someone who was looking into the future of, of clean meat. So someone who did um, sort of a, 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 a number of interviews as to where we are uh, mm-hmm. on the clean meat space. And there are some ideas that someone could say, uh, you go to a brewery, you know, some breweries have restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can imagine that with meat production in the future, you could be in a brewery that has on one side the tanks that are that have yeast and everything that are that are brewing the beer, and then on the other side you've got the cells that are being cultured and uh, and, and, and cultured into meat, mm-hmm. and those things are being produced and sort of given to you on the table, um, and that's. That's not that strange, right? So you it's a little bit weird, but I like the idea at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a biotechnological process that gives you beer, uh, and this is another biotechnological process that's going to give you meat. Right? So it's, hmm. I, I think it's going to take it's going to take a bit of education, and I think, uh, but I think it's uh, there are a lot of very smart people who are working on these topics, uh, smarter than I am, obviously, <laughs> which is why we're looking for them. Um, uh, and and Merck is at the at the forefront of um, of, of cell culture and cell culture media development, uh, and even sort of bioreactor uh, production. So uh, we see that we could be a very good enabler uh, of, of these kind of industries. Yeah, a facilitator of this kind of uh, emerging technologies, um, <laughs> and which is which is why we we are really looking to to collaborate uh, a bit more with uh, with startups that are that are looking to scale faster, uh, because I think we. Working with them on their needs uh, mm-hmm. can can actually help us uh, develop the kind of tools that they require to stop just being an emerging industry and actually a scaling industry. So, and and, and that's a good point. And basically, you're saying why it's interesting for both startups and corporations and big corporations and conglomerates to work together because I believe, like you said, tech uh, startups have uh, a way of doing things faster and sometimes mm-hmm. unrelentlessly that sometimes corporations cannot because of a lot of things. And before we go on, and I need to ask another thing, you mentioned organs. Yeah, right. Are you saying like 3D printing organs? Uh, that, yeah, that could be, that, 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 that could be one, one aspect. So I mean, we had in our last, uh, in, in the intake uh, that's just passed and the, one of the teams that we're currently uh, working with, um, are, are building a 3D bioprinter. So they've built quite a quite interesting 3D bioprinter, uh, uh, and they've started off with um, uh, with skin. Uh, but the kind of scaffold technology that they uh, that they're developing uh, could actually lead to us um, sort of being able to 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 cheaply, well, uh, in relative terms, mm-hmm. uh, be able to actually um, uh, 3D print uh, some functional organs. Uh, this may be more more relevant for for clinical testing, so um, in discover in drug discovery, mm-hmm. uh, maybe not for for transplantation, uh, but uh, but I mean there are there's a lot of, there's a lot going on out there in tissue engineering um, uh, that, that 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 lead me to be confident that um, this this will be uh, this will be pretty standard fare, right? So having people print three D organs. Um, every once in a while. That, so we're basically becoming cyborgs as time goes by. And, <laughs> and one of the things that, that as soon as you said that the, the organs parts, I remember, I don't know if you know, but uh, probably you'll know this for way longer than I, but I saw a few years ago, there was um, an NBA player who ruptured his ACL. And, mm. they, and back then, ACL tears and ruptures were still almost a career ender. 
And apparently there was a couple of scientists that figured out that they could 3D print from skin samples, not necessarily the, 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 the ligament, but a tube that acted as a ligament mm. capture that made the ligament, as it was reconnected, they, they did the surgery and everything, but they, they put a, a tube with a specific liquid that they could eventually further accelerate the, um, the ligament get, getting back together. They did some tests. So basically they 3D printed something microscopic to be in the ligaments of the knee, which I found that at the same time impressive, but at the same time incredible mm -hmm. and scary. And I think that they 3D printed it with pig cells actually, for some reason. Okay. Yeah, okay. For some yeah. reason, I don't know who, why. <laughs> um, uh, the tissue engineer in me is, is non-existent, so I couldn't tell you either. <laughs> but th th doesn't this, isn't this so futuristic that we're in 2019 and you can, we can be talking about something that in my mind would only happen in 500 years from now where people could engineer ourselves. I'm fat. Let's try and <laughs> remove with a, with a vacuum cleaner as a, almost all some kind of vacuum cleaner esque, like the, um, what's, what's it called when people get the, the it's not acupuncture, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, you mean the, uh, the, uh, the post tissue removal. Yeah, adipose tissue, yeah. Yeah. So we can do that and eventually say, ah, I have a weak stomach. Oh, worry not. We have here <laughs> a non gluten resistant, a gluten resistant stomach just for you. <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, I think, I think, uh, behavioral change is working as well. So I, I, I suspect, I suspect, I suspect as we, as we develop many of these technologies, uh, people are, are getting to understand the the impact of um, of sedentary lifestyles and um, and nutrition uh, on health. Um, uh, I think we'll gradually see people see more 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 and more people taking uh, taking action. Uh, I don't think we will. We, I don't think people will wait until uh, these sort of so called easy solutions right come up. Uh, it would like be great. Counter, I would love that. I would over love the that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, over the counter slimming pill, right? So straight away. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but but imagine this: look, your beach uh, body. So for example, I have a big nose. So you have a big nose. Here are a set of seventeen thousand noses collected by the the newest beautiful market of the world. But I think uh, I don't know. I, I find this fascinating that I'm able to talk this and even being able to imagine it as something that I might see with my own eyes. Something that it's thirty seven hundred yeah. BC. The world has yeah. been ravaged by a plague and now everybody, uh, this is incredible. This is unbelievable. No, no, I, no I, absolutely. Uh, but I think, I think we might end up spending more time, um, more time in the, in the virtual worlds that uh, we, we won't care too much. True. True. That, yeah, that, that's so a little bit see. sad. I mean, but you're, you're now working with VR as well. So let's see, eventually exactly, the VR yes. can help us get better as well. I have a question for you actually. So, Mm. I wonder how the, um, so we already know the good things on a local level for the startups and on a specific level for Merck as well, but how does the program help Merck itself generate business and re generate revenue and new opportunities outside of the, the main focus of pharma, uh, component materials and everything? Does, do these ideas help you also build other business activities? Yeah, absolutely. So especially when we when we when we talk about the the, the innovation fields I was just mentioning, so clean meat, uh, biosensing, and in the liquid biopsy space, um, mm -hmm. these are places where um, the American Innovation Center, so our mother organization, um, is actually uh, building new businesses. Um, so building new ideas that turn into businesses uh, that could scale for Merck in the future. Uh, and so for for that, uh, because we're entering into markets. Uh, we 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 might not have a big presence in. Uh, mm -hmm. We might be leveraging uh, technologies that we already have, expertise that we already have, but entering into, into, into slightly new market segments or new market segments, local market segments. It helps to have the speed of um, to, to 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 aid with the speed of a, of an agile partner like a startup. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we we have processes in place uh, that allow for um, follow on financing. Uh, of some of these new solutions, uh, so you can imagine that um, uh, when when we interact with a team that has a very very good technology, uh, a very good new biosensing technology, 
Um, uh, and we try to interact, integrate that with uh, some Merck therapeutic uh, know-how and technologies as well uh, and put together a carve-out with the startup uh, that could be jointly driven internally mm -hmm. as an internal project with funding from our business building fund uh, and with um, uh, the expertise and the know-how that resides within Merck. So this could really speed up uh, both us and the startup's Uh, route to route to to market, mm -hmm. especially if we throw in our regulatory experience, if we throw in uh, the, Q, uh, the the quality control and quality assurance uh, mechanisms that we have, um, that actually could speed the way in which uh, both companies could actually um, uh, reach target customers or patients. That's very good, and 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 I agree. It's it's a very great opportunity for for the speed of one place and the security and availability and resource of the other one to connect in the middle mm -hmm. and be valuable for both. But at the same time, go to the both extremes and be able to provide a lot of value in the short, yeah. medium and long term as well. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up and start doing the, the final chances, we actually have for the first time a question of the audience. And Valentino oh, really? Regale <laughs> asks, <laughs> One question I asked him. Uh, how such a big pharma like Merck envisions its ability to stay updated with fast emerging new technology in order to maintain its competition on the market? Um, yeah, so um, I think uh, seeing where that question is coming from, I think that gives you a hint <laughs> at part of my answer, right? Um, so so, so we, have, um, we, have, we have partnerships as one of our, um, uh, one of our, one of our clear strategies. Uh, to ensure that we maintain uh, uh, the pace of development and insights within uh, within within the market and industries, mm -hmm. um, uh, we have this this amazing innovation center and innovation hub uh, model where we're trying to interact with um, uh, different uh, um, uh, different inventors, uh, academia, other corporates um, uh, on a partnership level to um, to really keep up to date with what's happening. Um, uh, in the different ecosystems and in the different um, uh, sources for innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're also building internal capabilities uh, through our um, uh, innovation center ideation activities and our business building activities. Um, and clearly, uh, we're trying to fight the war talents as well. Uh, so always trying to attract um, uh, interest, uh, different Uh, uh, different profiles uh, to join the company. Uh, we recently, uh, well, what's recent? Two years ago, uh, Merck also set up a digital office. Uh, oh. We now have, we now have, um, I think, 85 more data scientists that are specifically focused uh, on on building new digital solutions, right? Than than when I started, um, and for a company like Merck, that was really. So most of the experts that we have are from the life sciences or chemical space. Mm -hmm. So we have people with PhDs uh, in the life sciences and natural sciences and a lot of people uh, coming from the chemistry side. Um, but of late, more of our, uh, more of our hires actually have, um, have a digital or data science background. Um, uh, so the, the company is really reshaping itself to be a science and technology company and trying to maintain that, 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 that approach of Uh, providing the right kind of solutions uh, based on curiosity uh, and driven by um, by good science. Do you ever think that the at the, the speed and the pace of the of technology changes and the new ch technology adventures that even Merck is getting access to that the concept of pharma company will ever be distinguished from what it is today? <laughs> Uh, so yes, so one of the uh, the, the premises of um, uh, our biosensing innovation field is that uh, most of the technologies that we will interact with there are going to change the way in which um, the pharma business model is going to work. Uh, so I think a lot more outcome driven, um, uh, a lot more value is going to be be extracted for uh, a lot more value for for pharma is going to be seen through the outcomes of the, the therapies or the solutions that we provide. Um, so I see that digital would be a very, very, uh, so the, the digital plays, uh, the sensing, uh, all this information uh, will sort of lead to a very, very new uh, paradigm in which mm -hmm. we're, we're, we can track um, uh, more of the impact of, of our therapeutic interventions within mm -hmm. patients. Uh, we can direct the right drug to the right patient uh, at the right time in the right space, right? So, and actually get the right kind of outcome 
uh, and ensure that people have, um, so essentially the precision medicine uh, approach will come to play. Um, and, and this kind of approach will also lead to uh, the payers, so insurance companies, uh, healthcare uh, governments, uh, mm-hmm. so governments and healthcare ministries, uh, having, uh, having more room um, uh, to decide on the, the value of, um, uh, of any, uh, any therapeutic action that, uh, that a, a pharma company or a health company uh, mm-hmm. so maybe maybe the pharma company might not be uh, the the right name, but the healthcare company uh, would 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 be prescribing. What do you think? It's the future, actually, of the pharma world. Because recently, I told you that I did an interview with uh, the founder, because you just mentioned healthcare, and the founder that I interviewed, uh, Barnaby Perks, for the Tech Open Air podcast that I did. He said mm-hmm. something that I found extremely interesting and because a lot of people say that the problem with pharmacy as well, and we can have this on the podcast as well, is that a lot of people say that pharmacy and healthcare are built upon a profit, mar- a profit motive and therefore they're built not necessarily to cure us, but to help us string along the, the world. And uh, Barnaby said that the, we should focus on getting cures and not necessarily just healthcare, but I'm trying to get the quote. But let's put it on the other side. What's your opinion on the public perception that a lot of times people say that pharmacy is built because of the profit of motive or the motive of profit rather it's built on keeping us alive and unnecessarily curious um uh, so uh, so with with that last statement i probably thoroughly disagree right so um <laughs> uh I, I i don't think uh, especially i mean i know for a fact uh, the people that are that, that, that work in the in the in, in the pharma space um mm-hmm. the researchers that are in the buildings down the road here. Mm-hmm. Uh, those guys aren't aren't that cynical. So they mm-hmm. are spending long hours in labs, long hours in sort of with with, with different uh, with different approaches to uh, to the science to really touch on the points uh, and figure out what kind of therapies we can bring um, uh, to the patient uh, to 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 actually. Um, so they are really focused. They are mission driven sort of mm-hmm. pretty much like the entrepreneurs that you interact with. They are very much um, taking a science approach. It takes much longer. Uh, and lately, I have to say, yes, it's true. The productivity in pharmaceutical industry is becoming, a, is decreasing a bit. Um, finding the right uh, drugs is becoming more and more expensive mm-hmm. um, uh, because they're not coming at, at, a, at a faster pace as they used to. And there are more failures that are, that are, uh, failures um, uh, that are taking place for the targets that are in, in, in the, the trials phase, phases, and to be honest, uh, we all see it, especially in the U.S. Healthcare is becoming much, much more costlier than it's ever been. But it's, but it's because um, that's, sorry to interrupt you, but I also see that, and and I agree with you. I'm not as cynical as my on this part. I truly believe that people that go through this world want to cure people. Otherwise, I don't think yeah. I think it, there are simpler ways to make money, and yeah. The, the, I, what I seem to see, and this is my opinion on why healthcare mm-hmm. and some even pharmacy innovation doesn't go as fast mm-hmm. as possible right now, it's because a lot of the things have already been discovered. So when nothing was discovered, discovering one thing was an infinite times bigger because zero from one is bigger. One to 10, yeah. it's just nine more, it's in theory, just nine more pills, nine more pharma, pharmacology things, but it's nine times or 10 times bigger than the, the, the previous one. If you go from 10 to 20, it's just two times. So the problem is that a lot mm-hmm. of people, and we're now dealing at a global scale more and more on the health space where one innovation kind of gets applied all over the world. So it's harder to maintain and to be sure that you can tackle things that are specifically for the Mediterranean biology and um, let's say biology, but at the same time, the way that our body responds. So I, I agree with you. And it, that's why I think it's hard. And healthcare... Yeah. A lot of people, like you just said, they sit down, they don't do a lot of things, they eat bad things, they eat feces apparently when they eat meat. <laughs> so a lot of things come with the sedentary, very sedentary lifestyle that we have today. And if we can be mm-hmm. honest, our body is not made for this. We are made to run and f- try and get bowls and then not eat for like four or five, or five days. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's, it's one of the, and, and, and I have to say, I mean, it's, and this is one of the reasons why uh, we're also thinking, so a lot of, um, a lot of Merck, um, uh, a lot of Merck folks actually uh, looking at things beyond, um, beyond the, 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 the drugs, right? So, exactly. Uh, a lot of people are looking at the enabling technologies. Facilitating. Uh, in, in our case, 
Sorry? Facilitating technology. <laughs> yeah, the, the facilitating technologies, right? So, so in our in our case, for for instance, this is why we had a strong, strong in, um, uh, import that we put a strong, strong importance on on this biosensing and interfaces field, because we see that um, also. So the the kind of the kind of data that you can get from real time mo- real time monitoring mm-hmm. um, of 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 of, uh, of how medical treatment is going, right? So you can be adaptive uh, when the patient when the when the patient is not reacting. You don't just give someone uh, twenty. You don't just give someone uh, okay, take these twenty pills and then you'll be good. Let's see what happens. Yeah. But but you exactly right. So, so right now, sort of really sort of focusing on has this has this treatment actually changed anything? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's uh, um, how can we adapt it? Is it a dosage problem? So these things, if you have if you have the right kind of sensors and the right kind of monitoring, you can adapt. Um, you can actually track the outcomes, um, and and this this actually enables uh, the the payers at the end of the day to say, okay, I can judge the value of this drug, mm-hmm. and I will pay based on the value. Mm-hmm. I think that, that that's so, also and another thing that you mentioned is that it's also interesting because. If you can tackle a more adaptive thing, you also have the non-invasive biopsies or the non-invasive procedures that can also measure. So you can almost have a daily adaptivity to depending on the situation that you're suffering. So that's very interesting in the future. Okay, I I trust in Merck Accelerator and I trust in Merck to to bring (laughs) us to a future in pharmacy and pharmacology, but also at the same time, the future of healthcare, eventually the, the future of well-being. And I think that's also something that you're trying to achieve. Absolutely, and 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 I think the so just like you, I think we we tr- we also really trust in um, in 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 the in the in the entrepreneurial space, right? So in the entrepreneurial spirit, to actually take these challenges head on, right? So um, uh, if you notice the the, the kind of uh, healthcare professionals that that enter into the the entrepreneurship space, they are really driven, right? So they mm-hmm. are really mission focused people. Uh, they understand the issues and they're trying uh, to alleviate some of the problems that they um, uh, they see in their day to day to really bring the solutions for for patients uh, to mm-hmm. and and this is this is the kind of thing we're trying to support as well. Perfect. Well, Munya, before we wrap up, I have to ask you a couple of questions. I ask everyone uh, some rapid fire questions. So the first one is, please tell me one to three books that have impacted your life the most. Uh, one, two, three books. Um, what has been, what has had the most impact for me? That's a very challenging question. <laughs> uh, if I, if I, if I limit it, uh, to, to one, uh, I guess, uh, the value of deep work has been quite impactful in the last, few Newport, days, right? last few years. Yeah. That's been valuable in the last few, a few years. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at one. <laughs> okay, perfect, no problem. Um, if I gave you six months to prepare for a TED Talk, uh, and it could not be about innovation or pharmacology or biomedicine or anything, what would it be about? Um, it would be about, um, I guess, uh, development of emerging, uh, developing of emerging countries. Yeah. I, I'm sure I'll sneak in innovation in this. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it, of course. Um, please tell me one buzzword that you would love for the industry to stop using. <laughs> uh, innovation. <laughs> <laughs> Munya, it was truly, 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 truly a lovely conversation. I really loved all the things that we met, discussed. And I really hope that in a couple of months, we can have you back on the show because this was very, a very enlightening conversation about it. a number of topics that I had no idea. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for having me. This was a very, very pleasant conversation. Really so loved it. <laughs> the question that I have for you is, where can people find more about you and people get in touch and also apply for the market okay. accelerator? So, um, so our, our website is accelerator.merkgroup.com. Uh, I am at Munya Chivs on Twitter. Um, I, I do have an Instagram handle, but I forgot it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, with that in mind, people get in touch. Muni is a great person and this was actually a lovely conversation. So please get in touch. And if you're in any way interested in these areas, check out the accelerator because I'm sure it will be a great investment of your time, but also resources. And you'll obviously learn a lot and be able to pursue a dream and vision. Talk to you later. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for plugging into this episode. I truly hope you love this conversation as much as I did. I really hope you do reach out to Monia and get to know her. If you're a startup in the fields we mentioned, clean meat, biosensing interfaces, or other industries that you think could be interesting, apply to the Merck Accelerator in Darmstadt. This link for the application process and any other information that you might have missed will probably be linked up in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, consider subscribing to make sure that this podcast grows. We can get some more people and help everyone be the pioneers of their lives and careers. Also, if there's any feedback that you might have for me, reach out on social media and please leave a rating and review on iTunes. A big thank you to Monia for this incredibly pleasant and insightful conversation and to Nora Welbeck from Piabo PR for arranging this conversation as well. A big shout out to DJ Rodia for the music of the Pioneer Show. So, have a nice time. Talk to you later.